So with all the terminal challenges now complete and a stocking full of helpful hints, it's time to attempt the main challenge questions. Question one, visit the North Pole and beyond at the Winter Wonder landing level to collect the first page of the great book using a giant snowball. What's the title of that page? This first objective is pretty trivial and doesn't involve anything technical. We just need to go back to the Winter Wonder landing level and roll a snowball over the pages of the great book to collect it. This is particularly easy having completed all of the terminal challenges as we now have a full complement of snowball manipulation tools. Once collected, the page appears in our stocking and the title is about this book. Task one, complete. Task two, investigate the letters to Santa application at l2s.northpolechristmastown.com. What is the topic of the great book page available in the web brew of the server? What is Alabaster Snowball's password? Taking an initial look at the Letter to Santa app, we see a bunch of input fields. So my first thoughts were injection, but the hints from Sparkle Redberry suggest that this is a much easier start. And indeed, based on the name of the first great book page found in task one, we can make a pretty good guess at what the next page is called and just enter it into the browser URL bar. This page is called on the topic of flying animals. Alabaster's password is a little more tricky to find, but again, Sparkle's hints provide a pretty good direction. The HTML source of the Letters to Santa page includes a reference to another site, dev.northpolechristmastown.com. This is a partially developed toy request form, apparently built on the Apache Struts framework. A few security weaknesses were discovered in Struts this past year, and the hints suggest this app is probably vulnerable to CVE 2017-9805 and helpfully provides some pretty reliable exploit code. Running this against the target looks like it works, but there's no return path for communication. Here the hint suggests running a PHP based web shell, but I decided to opt instead for a netcache reverse shell. This involves setting up a listener on my local machine and ensuring my firewall is configured to forward this port. I then relaunch the exploit with a command to open up a reverse shell and voila, the connection is established. There's no command prompt like in a normal terminal shell, but it works just fine. Given the server was running Tomcat, I guess there'd be a JDBC connection string somewhere, so I did a search using grep. This suggested a username and password would probably be found in the ordermysql.class file. And sure enough, there it was. Task two, complete. Task three. The North Pole engineering team uses a Windows SMB server for sharing documentation and correspondence. Using your access to the Letters of Santa server, identify and enumerate the SMB file sharing server. What is the file server share name? In the last task, we achieved a remote shell on the Letters of Santa server. Now we have a foothold inside the internal network, we can start to enumerate other hosts and move laterally. A quick ifconfig gives away the internal IP address and root should indicate the subnet. In this case, it's unexpectedly 255.255.255.255. I guess this is just a quirk of the virtualization setup used by the folks who built this challenge. So assuming a slash 24 network instead, let's get scanning. Nmap shows seven active hosts, one of which, dot eight, has an SMB service running. Also noteworthy is the host that we're currently connected to, 11, which has an SSH server running. SSH can be used to tunnel network connections through firewalls. Here, I set up an SSH tunnel to the SMB service on dot 8, using the same username and password for the SSH connection as was discovered in task 2, as our hint suggests that Alabaster adopts poor password practices by reusing the same password. The SSH connection is successful, but in any attempt to connect to the SMB service fails with a bad username password error. At this point, I was pretty stunned for quite a while, but chatting to a couple of other players in the North Pole chat system, I got an extra pointer that perhaps I had the wrong target. And then going back to the original hints for this challenge, I spotted this one from Holly Evergreen, highlighting Nmap's default scan behavior. Without any additional options, Nmap does not conduct a full assessment of all ports of all IP addresses. Rather, it starts with a host discovery phase first, 
and then only scans those hosts that it discovered. And by default, Nmap will use a selection of common, but not necessarily foolproof, discovery methods. First, an ICMP echo request, then a TCP SYN packet to port 443, then a TCP ACK packet to port 80, and finally, an ICMP timestamp request. If a host is configured to not respond to any of these, then it is invisible to Nmap in its default operation. The host discovery behavior can be overridden with the dash PS flag, in this case, specifying that Nmap should explicitly check the SMB port 445. And sure enough, we see a new host, dot seven. Restarting the SSH tunnel with this new target host and rerunning the SMB service listing now shows the folders available on that server. We can also connect to the file store folder and obtain some additional documents useful for future parts of the challenge and another page of the great book. Task three complete. Task four. Elf Web Access is the preferred mailer for North Pole Elves, available internally at mail.northpolechristmastown.com. What can you learn from the great book page found in an email on that server? As the ELF web access system is only available internally, it's necessary to reconfigure the SSH tunnel to allow communication with the server on port 80. Simply connecting to this service via the tunneled IP and ports gives a default web server page. It's common to see multiple sites hosted on a single server via virtual host configurations, so we probably need to ensure that our request is addressed at mail.northpolechristmasdown.com for the server to return the right page. The easiest way to do this is to add a host entry to point all traffic for this domain to the local host IP address. Once this is added, mail.northpolechristmasdown.com resolves to 127.0.0.1 and is then routed down the SSH tunnel. This shows the ELF Web Access logon page. The EWA system has very verbose error messages disclosing that the correct format for usernames is forename.surname at northpolechristmastown.com. Unfortunately for us, Alabaster doesn't seem to have reused his usual password for his email account. The hints provided by Pepper Minstix suggest the solution to this part of the challenge might involve tampering with some cookies, and that the AES implementation may have some weaknesses with respect to handling unexpected lengths of input data. Pepper also suggests that some dev files may have been left over, but at least they shouldn't be discoverable by search engines. Search engines will typically look for a file called robots.txt in the web route for instructions on how they should or should not index a site. These instructions are just a request from the site owner, and there's no requirement that they must be followed. And sure enough, a robots.txt file does exist, and it asks search engines not to keep any record of a file named cookie.txt. So, in a vain attempt to hide some leftover dev files, Alabasta has left a massive clue for us humans. No access control has been applied to this file, so we're free to download it. It's a code snippet used for, for creating and validating authentication cookies, which has probably been used for this site. And sure enough, the format of the cookie returned by the EWA system matches that described in this code snippet. Examining the code's operation, it appears that upon login, some random characters are generated, the plain text, and encrypted with a secret key known to only the server, resulting in a ciphertext. Both plain text and ciphertext are set as a cookie. Any future client requests send this cookie information back to the server, which proceeds to decrypt the ciphertext with a secret key that only it knows. If the decrypted text matches the plain text provided, then the client must have already been authenticated to show the emails for the user specified. This has several huge flaws. Firstly, there doesn't appear to be any session management. If a valid login cookie is in intercepted, it can be replayed at any time to gain access to the app. Secondly, there is no link between the authentication token and the user ID. Once a valid user has logged in, they can modify their cookies username field to access any other user's data. Finally, and this is the crucial item to allow us access, the cookie checker logic breaks if it's fed data of an unexpected length. The cookie maker generates a cipher text of 21 bytes, 16 bytes for the IV or initial vector, and five bytes for the encrypted random text. 
It can therefore be assumed that the aes256.decrypt function called by cookie checker strips off the first 16 bytes of a given ciphertext to act as the IV and uses that to decrypt the remaining data. But if only 16 bytes of ciphertext are provided rather than 21, the decrypt function has no data left to decrypt after slicing off the IV. Decrypting nothing results in nothing. Then, back in the cookie checker function, this potential nothingness is compared to the plain text value provided by the cookie. If this too is nothing, then the authentication check is passed and access is granted to whichever user is provided in the username field of the cookie. This took me a long time to work out. I completely ended up overthinking the problem and heading off on all sorts of tangents. To help test the various theories I was working with, I fired up Burp Suite, a great tool for inspecting and tampering with web traffic. After capturing a couple of rib requests, it's simple to modify the request parameters and resubmit them. Having examined the web page source, it looked as if upon successful login, the user would be redirected to a page called account.html. So this was the target of my testing. Where cookie values were incorrect, the response was to bounce the user back to the login page at the web root. I used the command line base64 utility to encode my test data into the base64 format expected by the cookie checker script. Here we see several different lengths of data encoded as base64, all resulting in a bounce back to the login page. But then this one, at 15 bytes long, returned a full HTML page. This looks like success. I then reconfigured Burp Suite to intercept and modify any future responses so that the default cookie value returned by the site gets replaced with my malicious value. I needed to clear any previous cookies set by this site so that it attempt to give me a fresh default cookie which Burp Suite could then tamper with. And access granted. Browsing through the various emails, we see a link to the next page of the great book. Task 4 complete.